THE ROSE OF TUOLMI BY BRET HART THIS IS A LIBRIVOX RECORDING. ALL LIBRIVOX RECORDINGS ARE IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN. FOR MORE INFORMATION, OR TO FIND OUT HOW YOU CAN VOLUNTEER, PLEASE VISIT LIBRIVOX.ORG. CHAPTER One. IT WAS NEARLY TWO O'CLOCK IN THE MORNING. THE LIGHTS WERE OUT IN ROBINSON'S HALL, WHERE THERE HAD BEEN DANCING AND REVELRY and the moon, riding high, painted the black windows with silver. The cavalcade that an hour ago had shocked the sedate pines with song and laughter were all dispersed. One enamoured swain had ridden east, another west, another north, another south, and the object of their adoration, left within her bower at Chemisal Ridge, was calmly going to bed. I regret that I am not able to indicate the exact stage of that process. Two chairs were already filled with delicate inwrappings and white confusion, and the young lady herself, half hidden in the silky threads of her yellow hair, had at one time borne a faint resemblance to a partly husked ear of Indian corn. But she was now clothed in that one long formless garment that makes all women equal and the round shoulders and neat waist that an hour ago had been so fatal to the peace of mind of four forks had utterly disappeared the face above it was very pretty the foot below albeit shapely was not small the flowers as a general thing don't raise their heads much to look after me she had said with superb frankness to one of her lovers the expression of the rose to-night was contentedly placid she walked slowly to the curtain, and, making the smallest possible peephole through the curtain, looked out. The motionless figure of a horseman still lingered on the road, with an excess of devotion that only a coquette or a woman very much in love could tolerate. The rose, at that moment, was neither, and after a reasonable pause turned away, saying quite audibly that it was too ridiculous for anything. As she came back to her dressing-table, it was noticeable that she walked steadily and erect, without that slight affectation of lameness common to people with whom bare feet are only an episode. Indeed, it was only four years ago that without shoes or stockings, a long-limbed, colty girl in a wasteless calico gown, she had leaped from the tailboard of her father's emigrant wagon when it first drew up at the Chemisal Ridge certain wild habits of the rose had outlived transplanting and cultivation a knock at the door surprised her in another moment she had leaped into bed and with darkly frowning eyes from its secure recesses demanded who's there an apologetic murmur on the other side of the door was the response why father is that you there were further murmurs affirmative deprecatory and persistent wait said the rose she got up, unlocked the door, leaped nimbly into bed again, and said, Come. The door opened timidly. The broad, stooping shoulders and grizzled head of a man past the middle age appeared. After a moment's hesitation, a pair of large, diffident feet, shod with canvas slippers, concluded to follow. When the apparition was complete, it closed the door softly and stood there, a very shy ghost indeed with apparently more than the usual spiritual indisposition to begin a conversation the rose resented this impatiently though i fear not altogether intelligibly do father i declare you was a bed jinny said mr mccloskey slowly glancing with a singular mixture of masculine awe and paternal pride upon the two chairs and their contents you was a bed and undressed i was surely said mr mccloskey seating himself on the extreme edge of the bed and painfully tucking his feet away under it surely after a pause he rubbed a short thick stumpy beard that bore a general resemblance to a badly worn blacking brush with the palm of his hand and went on you had a good time jinny yes father they was all there yes rance and york and ryder and jack and jack Mr. McCloskey endeavored to throw an expression of arch inquiry into his small, tremulous eyes, but meeting the unabashed, widely opened lid of his daughter, he winked rapidly and blushed to the roots of his hair. "'Yes, 
"'Jack was there,' said Jenny, without change of color or the least self-consciousness in her great gray eyes, "'and he came home with me.' She paused a moment, locking her two hands under her head and assuming a more comfortable position on the pillow. "'He asked me that same question again, Father, and I said, "'Yes, it's to be soon. We're going to live at Four Forks in his own house, and next winter we're going to Sacramento. I suppose it's all right, Father, eh?' She emphasized the question with a slight kick through the bedclothes, as the parental McCloskey had fallen into an abstract reverie. "'Yes, surely,' said Mr. McCloskey, recovering himself with some confusion. After a pause he looked down at the bedclothes, and, patting them tenderly, continued, "'You couldn't have done better, Jinny. They isn't a girl in Tulumi as could strike it as rich as you have, even if they got the chance.' He paused again, and then said, "'Jinny?' "'Yes, father.' "'Usin' bed and undressed?' "'Yes.' "'You couldn't,' said Mr. McCloskey, glancing hopelessly at the two chairs and slowly rubbing his chin. "'You couldn't dress yourself again, could yer?' "'Why, father?' "'Kinder get yourself into them things again,' he added hastily. "'Not all of em, you know, but some of em. Not if I helped your sorter stood by and lend a hand now and then with a strap or a buckle or, or a necktie or a shoestring.' he continued, still looking at the chairs and evidently trying to boldly familiarize himself with their contents. "'Are you crazy, father?' demanded Jenny, suddenly sitting up with a portentous switch of her yellow mane. Mr. McCloskey rubbed one side of his beard, which already had the appearance of having been quite worn away by that process, and faintly dodged the question. "'Jenny,' he said tenderly, stroking the bedclothes as he spoke, this year's what's the matter there's a stranger downstairs a stranger to you lovey but a man as i've knowed a long time he's been there about an hour and he'll be here until four o'clock when the upstage passes now i want she jinny dear to get up and come downstairs and kinder help me pass the time with him it's no use jinny he went on gently raising his hand to deprecate any interruption it's no use he won't go to bed he won't play keards whiskey don't take no effect on him ever since i knowed him he was the most unsatisfactory critter to have around what do you have him around for then interrupted miss jenny sharply mr mccluskey's eyes fell if he hadn't come out of his way to-night to do me a good turn i wouldn't ask you jenny i wouldn't so help me but i thought as i couldn't do anything with him you might come down and sorter of fetch him jenny as you did the others miss jenny shrugged her pretty shoulders is he old or young he's young enough jenny he knows a power of things what does he do not much i reckon he's got money in the mill at four forks he travels round a good deal i've heard jenny that he's a poet writes them rhymes you know mr mccluskey here appealed submissively but directly to his daughter he remembered that she had frequently been in receipt of printed elegiac couplets known as mottoes containing enclosures equally saccharine miss jenny slightly curled her pretty lip she had that fine contempt for the illusions of fancy which belongs to the perfectly healthy young animal not continued mr mccluskey rub rubbing his head reflectively not as i'd advise ye jenny to say anything to him about poetry it ain't twenty minutes ago as i did i set the whiskey afore him in the parlor i wound up the music box and set it going then i says to him sociable like and free just consider yourself in your own house and repeat what you allow to be your finest production and he raged that man jenny just raged there's no end of the names he called me you see jenny continued mr mccloskey apologetically he's known me a long time but his daughter had already dismissed the question with her usual directness i'll be down in a few moments father she said after a pause but don't say anything to him about it don't say i was abed mr mccloskey's face beamed you was allers a good girl jenny he said dropping on one knee the better to imprint a respectful kiss on her forehead but jenny caught him by the wrists and for a moment held him captive father she said trying to fix his shy eyes with the clear steady glance of her own all the girls that were there to-night had some one with them mame robinson had her aunt lucy rance had her mother kate pearson had her sister all except me had some other woman father dear her lip trembled just a little i wish mother hadn't died when i was so small i wish there was some other woman in the family besides me 
i ain't lonely with you father dear but if there was only someone you know when the time comes for john and me her voice here suddenly gave out but not her brave eyes that were still fixed earnestly upon his face mr mccluskey apparently tracing out a pattern on the bed quilt essayed words of comfort there ain't one of them gals as you've named jinny as could do what you've done with a whole noah's ark of relations at their backs there ain't one as wouldn't sacrifice her nearest relation to make the strike that you have as to mothers maybe my dear you're doing better without one he rose suddenly and walked toward the door when he reached it he turned and in his old deprecating manner said don't be long jinny smiled and vanished from the head downward his canvas slippers asserting themselves resolutely to the last when mr mccloskey reached his parlor again his troublesome guest was not there the decanter stood on the table untouched three or four books lay upon the floor a number of photographic views of the sierras were scattered over the sofa two sofa pillows a newspaper and a mexican blanket lay on the carpet as if the late occupant of the room had tried to read in a recumbent position a french window opening upon a veranda which never before in the history of the house had been unfastened now betrayed by its waving lace curtain the way that the fugitive had escaped mr mccloskey heaved a sigh of despair he looked at the gorgeous carpet purchased in sacramento at a fabulous price at the crimson satin and rosewood furniture unparalleled in the history of tuolumne at the massively framed pictures on the walls and looked beyond it through the open window to the reckless man who fleeing these sybaritic allurements was smoking a cigar upon the moonlit road this room which had so often awed the youth of tuolumne into filial respect was evidently a failure it remained to be seen if the rose herself had lost her fragrance i reckon jinny will fetch him yet said mr mccloskey with parental faith he stepped from the window upon the veranda but he had scarcely done this before this figure was detected by the stranger who at once crossed the road when within a few feet of mccloskey he stopped you persistent old plantigrade he said in a low voice audible only to the person addressed and a face full of affected anxiety why don't you go to bed didn't i tell you to go and leave me here alone in the name of all that's idiotic and imbecile why do you continue to shuffle about here or are you trying to drive me crazy with your presence as you have with that wretched music-box that i've just dropped under yonder tree it's an hour and a half yet before the stage passes do you think do you imagine for a single moment that i can tolerate you until then eh why don't you speak are you asleep you don't mean to say that you have the audacity to add somnambulism to your other weaknesses you're not low enough to repeat yourself under any such weak pretext as that eh a fit of nervous coughing ended this extraordinary exordium and half sitting half leaning against the veranda mr mccloskey's guest turned his face and part of a slight elegant figure toward his host the lower portion of this upturned face wore an habitual expression of fastidious discontent with an occasional line of physical suffering but the brow above was frank and critical and a pair of dark mirthful eyes sat in playful judgment over the supersensitive mouth and its suggestion i allowed to go to bed ridgeway said mr mccloskey meekly but my girl jinny's just got back from a little tear-up at robinson's and ain't inclined to turn in yet you know what girls is so i thought we three would just have a social chat together to pass away the time you mendacious old hypocrite she got back an hour ago said ridgeway as that savage-looking escort of hers who has been haunting the house ever since can testify my belief is that like an enterprising idiot as you are you've dragged that girl out of her bed that we might mutually bore each other mr mccloskey was too much stunned by this evidence of ridgeway's apparent superhuman penetration to reply after enjoying his host's confusion for a moment with his eyes ridgeway's mouth asked grimly and who is this girl anyway nancy's your wife's yes but look yer ridgeway said mccloskey laying one hand imploringly on ridgeway's sleeve not a word about her to jinny she thinks her mother's dead died in missouri eh ridgeway nearly rolled from the veranda in an excess of rage good god do you mean to say that you have been concealing from her a fact that any day any moment may come to her ears that you've been letting her grow up in ignorance of something that by this time she might have outgrown and forgotten that you have been like a besotted old ass all these years slowly forging a thunderbolt that any one may crush her with that 
but here Ridgway's cough took possession of his voice, and even put a moisture into his dark eyes as he looked at McCloskey's aimless hand feebly employed upon his beard. But, said McCloskey, look how she's done. She's held her head as high as any of em. She's to be married in a month to the richest man in the county, and— he added cunningly, Jack Ash ain't the kind of man to sit by and hear anything said of his wife or her relations, you bet. But hush, that's her foot on the stairs. She's comin'. She came. I don't think the French window ever held a finer view than when she put aside the curtains and stepped out. She had dressed herself simply and hurriedly, but with a woman's knowledge of her best points, so that she got the long curves of her shapely limbs, the shorter curves of her round waist and shoulder, the long sweep of her yellow braids, the light of her gray eyes, and even the delicate rose of her complexion, without knowing how it was delivered to you. The introduction by Mr. McCloskey was brief. When Ridgway had got over the fact that it was two o'clock in the morning, and that the cheek of this Tuolumne goddess nearest him was dewy and fresh as an infant's, that she looked like Marguerite, without probably ever having heard of Goethe's heroine, he talked, I dare say, very sensibly. When Miss Jenny, who from her childhood had been brought up among the sons of Anak, and who was accustomed to have the supremacy of our noble sex presented to her as a physical fact, found herself in the presence of a new and strange power in the slight and elegant figure beside her, she was at first frightened and cold. But finding that this power, against which the weapons of her own physical charms were of no avail, was a kindly one, albeit general, she fell to worshipping it, after the fashion of woman, and casting before it the fetishes and other idols of her youth. She even confessed to it, so that, in half an hour, Ridgway was in possession of all the facts connected with her life, and a great many, I fear, of her fancies, except one. When Mr. McCloskey found the young people thus amicably disposed, he calmly went to sleep. It was a pleasant time to each. To Miss Jenny it had the charm of novelty, and she abandoned herself to it for that reason much more freely and innocently than her companion, who knew something more of the inevitable logic of the position. I do not think, however, he had any intention of love-making. I do not think he was at all conscious of being in the attitude. I am quite positive he would have shrunk from the suggestion of disloyalty to the one woman whom he admitted to himself he loved. But, like most poets, he was much more true to an idea than a fact, and having a very lofty conception of womanhood with a very sanguine nature, he saw in each new face the possibilities of a realization of his ideal. It was, perhaps, an unfortunate thing for the women, particularly as he brought to each trial a surprising freshness which was very deceptive, and quite distinct from the blasé familiarity of the man of gallantry. It was this perennial virginity of the affections that most endeared him to the best women, who were prone to exercise toward him a chivalrous protection, as of one likely to go astray unless looked after, and indulged in the dangerous combination of sentiment with the highest maternal instincts. It was this quality which caused Jenny to recognize in him a certain boyishness that required her womanly care, and even induced her to offer to accompany him to the crossroads when the time for his departure arrived. With her superior knowledge of woodcraft and the locality, she would have kept him from being lost. I wot not but that she would have protected him from bears or wolves, but chiefly, I think, from the feline fascinations of Maine Robinson and Lucy Rance, who might be lying in wait for this tender young poet. Nor did she cease to be thankful that Providence had, so to speak, delivered him as a trust into her hands. It was a lovely night. The moon swung low and languished softly on the snowy ridge beyond. There were quaint odors in the still air, and a strange incense from the woods perfumed their young blood and seemed to swoon in their pulses. Small wonder that they lingered on the white road, and their feet climbed unwillingly the little hill where they were to part, and that when they at last reached it even the saving grace of speech seemed to have forsaken them. For there they stood alone. There was no sound nor motion in earth or woods or heaven. They might have been the one man and woman for whom this goodly earth that lay at their feet rimmed with the deepest azure was created and seeing this they turned toward each other with a sudden instinct and their hands met and then their lips in one long kiss 
and then out of the mysterious distance came the sound of voices and the sharp clatter of hooves and wheels and jenny slid away a white moonbeam from the hill for a moment she glimmered through the trees then reaching the house passed her sleeping father on the veranda and darting into her bedroom locked the door threw open the window and falling on her knees beside it leaned her hot cheeks upon her hands and listened in a few moments she was rewarded by the sharp clatter of hoofs on the stony road but it was only a horseman whose dark figure was swiftly lost in the shadows of the lower road at another time she might have recognized the man but her eyes and ears were now all intent on something else it came presently with dancing lights a musical rattle of harness a cadence of hoof-beats that set her heart to beating in unison and was gone a sudden sense of loneliness came over her and tears gathered in her sweet eyes she rose and looked around her there was the little bed the dressing-table the roses that she had worn last night still fresh and blooming in the little vase everything was there but everything looked strange the roses should have been withered for the party seemed so long ago she could hardly remember when she had worn this dress that lay upon the chair so she came back to the window and sank down beside it with her cheek a trifle paler leaning on her hand and her long braids reaching to the floor the stars paled slowly like her cheek yet with eyes that saw not she still looked from her window for the coming dawn it came with violet deepening into purple with purple flushing into rose with rose shining into silver and glowing into gold the straggling line of black picket fence below that had faded away with the stars came back with the sun what was that object moving by the fence jenny raised her head and looked intently it was a man endeavouring to climb the pickets and falling backward with each attempt suddenly she started to her feet as if the rosy flushes of the dawn had crimsoned her from forehead to shoulders then she stood white as the wall with her hands clasped upon her bosom then with a single bound she reached the door and with flying braids and fluttering skirts sprang down the stairs and out to the garden walk when within a few feet of the fence she uttered a cry the first she had given the cry of a mother over her stricken babe of a tigress over her mangled cub and in another moment she had leaped the fence and knelt beside ridgeway with his fainting head upon her breast my boy my poor poor boy who has done this who indeed his clothes were covered with dust his waistcoat was torn open and his handkerchief wet with the blood it could not staunch fell from a cruel stab beneath his shoulder ridgeway my poor boy tell me what has happened ridgeway slowly opened his heavy blue veined lids and gazed upon her presently a gleam of mischief came into his dark eyes a smile stole over his lips as he whispered slowly it was your kiss did it jenny dear i had forgotten how high-priced the article was here never mind jenny he feebly raised his hand to his white lips it was worth it and fainted away jenny started to her feet and looked wildly around her then with a sudden resolution she stooped over the insensible man and with one strong effort lifted him in her arms as if he had been a child when her father a moment later rubbed his eyes and woke from his sleep upon the veranda it was to see a goddess erect and triumph striding toward the house with the helpless body of a man lying across that breast where a man had never lain before a goddess at whose imperious mandate he arose and cast open the doors before her then when she had laid her unconscious burden on the sofa the goddess fled and a woman helpless and trembling stood before him a woman that cried out that she had killed him that she was wicked wicked and that even saying so staggered and fell beside her late burden all that mr mccloskey could do was to feebly rub his beard and say to himself vaguely and incoherently that jinny had fetched him chapter two before noon the next day it was generally believed throughout four forks that ridgeway dent had been attacked and wounded at chemisal ridge by a highwayman who fled on the approach of the wingdam coach it is to be presumed that this statement met with ridgeway's approval as he did not contradict it nor supplement it with any details his wound was severe but not dangerous 
after the first excitement had subsided there was i think a prevailing impression common to the provincial mind that his misfortune was the result of the defective moral quality of his being a stranger and was in a vague sort of way a warning to others and a lesson to him did you hear how that san francisco feller was took down the other night was the average tone of introductory remark indeed there was a general suggestion that ridgeway's presence was one that no self-respecting high-minded highwayman honourably conservative of the best interests of tuolumne county could for a moment tolerate except for the few words spoken on that eventful morning ridgeway was reticent of the past when jenny strove to gather some details of the affray that might offer a clue to his unknown assailant a subtle twinkle in his brown eyes was the only response when mr mccloskey attempted the same process the young gentleman threw abusive epithets and eventually slippers teaspoons and other lighter articles within the reach of an invalid at the head of his questioner i think he's coming round jinny said mr mccloskey he laid for me this morning with a candlestick it was about this time that Miss Jenny, having sworn her father to secrecy regarding the manner in which Ridgway had been carried into the house, conceived the idea of addressing the young man as Mr. Dent, and of apologizing for intruding whenever she entered the room in the discharge of her household duties. It was about this time that she became more rigidly conscientious to these duties, and less general in her attentions. It was at this time that the quality of the invalid's diet improved, and that she consulted him less frequently about it. It was about this time that she began to see more company, that the house was greatly frequented by her former admirers, with whom she rode, walked, and danced. It was at about this time also, and when Ridgeway was able to be brought out on the veranda in a chair, that, with great archness of manner, she introduced to him Miss Lucy Ash, the sister of her betrothed, a flashing brunette and terrible heartbreaker of four forks and in the midst of this gaiety she concluded that she would spend a week with the robinsons to whom she owed a visit she enjoyed herself greatly there so much indeed that she became quite hollow-eyed the result as she explained to her father of a too frequent indulgence in festivity you see father i won't have many chances after john and i are married you know how queer he is and i must make the most of my time and she laughed an odd little laugh which had lately become habitual to her and how is mr dent getting on her father replied that he was getting on very well indeed so well in fact that he was able to leave for san francisco two days ago he wanted to be remembered to you jinny remembered kindly yes they is the very words he used said mr mccloskey looking down and consulting one of his large shoes for corroboration miss jenny was glad to hear that he was so much better miss jenny could not imagine anything that pleased her more than to know that he was so strong as to be able to rejoin his friends again who must love him so much and be so anxious about him her father thought she would be pleased and now that he was gone there was really no necessity for her to hurry back miss jenny in a high metallic voice did not know that she had expressed any desire to stay still her presence had become distasteful at home if her own father was desirous of getting rid of her if when she was so soon to leave his roof forever he still begrudged her those few days remaining if my god jenny so help me said mr mccluskey clutching desperately at his beard i didn't go for to say anything of the kind i thought that you never mind father interrupted jenny magnanimously you misunderstood me of course you did you couldn't help it you're a man mr mccluskey sorely crushed would have vaguely protested but his daughter having relieved herself after the manner of her sex with a mental personal application of an abstract statement forgave him with a kiss nevertheless for two or three days after her return mr mccloskey followed his daughter about the house with yearning eyes and occasionally with timid diffident feet sometimes he came upon her suddenly at her household tasks with an excuse so palpably false and a careless manner so outrageously studied that she was fain to be embarrassed for him later he took to rambling about the house at night and was often seen noiselessly passing and repassing through the hall after she had retired on one occasion he was surprised first by sleep and then by the early rising jenny as he lay on the rug outside her chamber door you treat me like a child father said jenny i thought jenny said the father apologetically i i thought i heard sounds as if you was taken on inside and listening i fell asleep 
you dear old simple-minded baby said jenny looking past her father's eyes and lifting his grizzled locks one by one with meditative fingers what should i be taking on for look how much taller i am than you she said suddenly lifting herself up to the extreme of her superb figure then rubbing his head rapidly with both hands as if she were anointing his hair with some rare unguent she patted him on the back and returned to her room the result of this and one or two other equally sympathetic interviews was to produce a change in mr mccluskey's manner which was if possible still more discomposing he grew unjustifiably hilarious cracked jokes with the servants and repeated to jenny humorous stories with the attitude of facetiousness carefully preserved throughout the entire narration and the point utterly ignored and forgotten certain incidents reminded him of funny things which invariably turned out to have not the slightest relevancy or application he occasionally brought home with him practical humorists with a sanguine hope of setting them going like the music-box for his daughter's edification he essayed the singing of melodies with great freedom of style and singular limitation of note he sang come haste to the wedding ye lasses and maidens of which he knew a single line and that incorrectly as being peculiarly apt and appropriate yet away from the house and his daughter's presence he was silent and distraught his absence of mind was particularly noted by his workmen at the empire quartz mill if the old man don't look out and wake up said his foreman he'll have them feet of his yet under the stamps when he ain't given his mind to em they is altogether too promiscuous a few nights later miss jenny recognized her father's hand in a timid tap at the door she opened it and he stood before her with a valise in his hand equipped as for a journey i takes the stage to-night jenny dear from four forks to frisco maybe i may drop in on jack afore i go i'll be back in a week good-bye good-bye he still held her hand presently he drew her back into the room closing the door carefully and glancing around there was a look of profound cunning in his eye as he said slowly bear up and keep dark jinny dear and trust to the old man various men has various ways there is ways as is common and ways as is uncommon ways as is easy and ways as is uneasy bear up and keep dark with this delphic utterance he put his finger to his lips and vanished it was ten o'clock when he reached four forks a few minutes later he stood on the threshold of that dwelling described by the four forks sentinel as the palatial residence of john ash and known to the local satirist as the ash box heaven to lay by two hours john he said to his prospective son-in-law as he took his hand at the door a few words of social converse not on business but strictly private seems to be about as natural a thing as a man can do this introduction evidently the result of some study and plainly committed to memory seemed so satisfactory to mr mccloskey that he repeated it again after john ash had led him into his private office where depositing his valise in the middle of the floor and sitting down before it he began carefully to avoid the eye of his host john ash a tall dark handsome kentuckian with whom even the trifles of life were evidently full of serious import waited with a kind of chivalrous respect the further speech of his guest being utterly devoid of any sense of the ridiculous he always accepted mr mccloskey as a grave fact singular only from his own want of experience of the class ours is running light now said mr mccloskey with easy indifference john ash returned that he had noticed the same fact in the receipts of the mill at four forks mr mccloskey rubbed his beard and looked at his valise as if for sympathy and suggestion you don't reckon on having any trouble with them chaps as you cut out with jinny john ash rather haughtily had never thought of that i saw rents hanging around your house the other night when i took your daughter home but he gave me a wide berth he added carelessly surely said mr mccloskey with a peculiar winking of the eye after a pause he took a fresh departure from his valise a few words john as between man and man as between my daughter's father and her husband who expects to be is about the thing i take it as fair and square i came here to sam they're about jinny my gal ash's grave face brightened to mr mccloskey's evident discomposure maybe i should have said about her mother but the same being a stranger to you i says naturally jinny ash nodded courteously mr mccloskey with his eyes on his valise went on it was sixteen year ago as i married mrs mccloskey in the state of missouri she led on at the time to be a widder a widder with one child 
when i say led on i mean to imply that i subsequently found out that she was not a widder nor a wife and the father of the child was so to speak unbeknownst that child was jinny my gal with his eyes on his valise and quietly ignoring the whole crimson face and swiftly darkening brow of his host he continued many little things sorter of tended to make our home in missouri on pleasant a disposition to smash furniture and heave knives around an inclination to howl when drunk and that frequent a habitual use of vulgar language and a tendency to cuss the casual visitor seemed to pint added mr mccloskey with submissive hesitation that she was so to speak quite unsuited to the marriage relation in its holiest aspect damnation why didn't burst out john ash erect and furious at the end of two year continued mr mccloskey still intent on the valise i allowed i'd get a divorce at about that time however providence sends a circus into that town and a feller as rode three horses to onst having allah's a taste for athletic sports she left town with this feller leaving me and jenny behind i sent word to her that if she would give jenny to me we'd call it quits and she did tell me gasped ash did you ask your daughter to keep this from me or did she do it of her own accord she doesn't know it said mr mccloskey she thinks i'm her father and that her mother's dead then sir this is your i don't know said mr mccloskey slowly as i've asked to any one to marry my jinny i don't know as i've pursued that as a business or even taken it up as a healthful recreation john ash paced the room furiously mr mccloskey's eyes left the valise and followed him curiously where is this woman demanded ash suddenly mccloskey's eyes sought the valise again she went to kansas from kansas she went to texas from texas she eventually came to california being here i provided her with money when her business was slack through a friend john ash groaned she's getting rather old and shaky for hosses and now does the tightrope business and flying trapeze never having seen her perform continued mr mccloskey with conscientious caution i can't say how she gets on on the bills she looks well thar is a poster said mr mccloskey glancing at ash and opening his valise thar is a poster given her performance at marysville next month mr mccloskey slowly unfolded a large yellow and blue printed poster profusely illustrated she calls herself mamselle j mcgloskey the great russian trapezist john ash tore it from his hand of course he said suddenly facing mr mccloskey you don't expect me to go on with this mr mccloskey took up the poster carefully refolded it and returned it to his valise when you break off with jinny he said quietly i don't want anything said about this she doesn't know it she's a woman and i reckon you're a white man but what am i to say how am i to go back of my word write her a note say something has come to your knowledge don't say what that makes you break it off you needn't be afeard jinny will ever ask you what john ash hesitated he felt he had been cruelly wronged no gentleman no ash could go on further in this affair it was preposterous to think of it but somehow he felt at the moment very unlike a gentleman or an ash and was quite sure he should break down under jenny's steady eyes but then he could write to her so ours is about as light here as on the ridge well i reckon they'll come up before the rains good night mr mccloskey took the hand that his host mechanically extended shook it gravely and was gone when mr mccloskey a week later stepped again upon his own veranda he saw through the french window the figure of a man in his parlor under his hospitable roof the sight was not unusual but for an instant a subtle sense of disappointment thrilled him when he saw it was not the face of ash turned toward him he was relieved but when he saw the tawny beard and quick passionate eyes of henry rance he felt a new sense of apprehension so that he fell to rubbing his beard almost upon his very threshold jenny ran into the hall seized her father with a little cry of joy father said jenny in a hurried whisper don't mind him indicating rance with a toss of her yellow braids he's going soon and i think father i've done him wrong but it's all over with john and me now read that note and see how he's insulted me her lip quivered but she went on it's ridgeway that he means father and i believe that it was his hand struck ridgeway down or that he knows who did but hush now not a word 
she gave him a feverish kiss and glided back into the parlor leaving mr mccloskey perplexed and irresolute with the note in his hand he glanced at it hurriedly and saw that it was couched in almost the very words he had suggested but a sudden apprehensive recollection came over him he listened and with an exclamation of dismay he seized his hat and ran out of the house but too late at the same moment a quick nervous footstep was heard upon the veranda the french window flew open and with a light laugh of greeting ridgeway stepped into the room jenny's finer ear first caught the step jenny's swifter feelings had sounded the depths of hope joy of despair before he entered the room jenny's pale face was the only one that met his self-possessed and self-reliant when he stood before them an angry flush suffused even the pink roots of rance's beard as he rose to his feet an ominous fire sprang into ridgeway's eyes and a spasm of hate and scorn passed over the lower part of his face and left the mouth and jaw immobile and rigid yet he was the first to speak i owe you an apology he said to jenny with a suave scorn that brought the indignant blood back to her cheek for this intrusion but i ask no pardon for withdrawing from the only spot where that man dare confront me with safety with an exclamation of rage ranch sprang toward him but as quickly jenny stood between them erect and menacing there must be no quarrel here she said to rance while i protect your right as my guest don't oblige me to remind you of mine as your hostess she turned with a half-deprecatory air to ridgeway but he was gone only rance remained with a look of ill-concealed triumph on his face without looking at him she passed toward the door when she reached it she turned you asked me a question an hour ago come to me in the garden at nine o'clock to-night and i will answer you but promise me first to keep away from mr dent give me your word not to seek him to avoid him if he seeks you do you promise it is well he would have taken her hand but she waved him away in another moment he heard the swift rustle of her dress in the hall the sound of her feet upon the stair the sharp closing of her bedroom door and all was quiet and even thus quietly the day wore away and the night rose slowly from the valley and overshadowed the mountains with purple wings that fanned the still air into a breeze until the moon followed it and lulled everything to rest as with the laying on of white and benedictory hands it was a lovely night but henry rance waiting impatiently beneath a sycamore at the foot of the garden saw no beauty in earth or air or sky a thousand suspicions common to a jealous nature a vague superstition of the spot filled his mind with distrust and doubt if this should be a trick to keep my hands off that insolent pup he muttered but even as the thought passed his tongue a white figure slid from the shrubbery near the house glided along the line of picket fence and then stopped midway motionless in the moonlight it was she but he scarcely recognized her in the white drapery that covered her head and shoulders and breast he approached her with a hurried whisper let us withdraw from the moonlight everybody can see us here we have nothing to say that cannot be said in the moonlight henry rance she replied coldly receding from his proffered hand she trembled for a moment as if with a chill then suddenly turned upon him hold up your head and let me look at you i've known only what men are let me see what a traitor looks like he recoiled more from her wild face than her words he saw from the first that her hollow cheeks and hollow eyes were blazing with fever he was no coward but he would have fled you are ill jenny he said you had best return to the house another time stop she cried hoarsely move from this spot and i'll call for help attempt to leave now and i'll proclaim you the assassin that you are it was a fair fight he said doggedly was it a fair fight to creep behind an unarmed and unsuspecting man was it a fair fight to try to throw suspicion on someone else was it a fair fight to deceive me liar and coward that you are he made a stealthy step toward her with evil eyes and a wickeder hand that crept within his breast she saw the motion but it only stung her to newer fury strike she said with blazing eyes throwing her hands open before him strike are you afraid of the woman who dares you or do you keep your knife for the backs of unsuspecting men strike i tell you no look then with a sudden movement she tore from her head and shoulders the thick lace shawl that had concealed her figure and stood before him look she cried passionately pointing to the bosom and shoulders of her white dress darkly streaked with faded stains and ominous discoloration look this is the dress i wore that morning when i found him lying there here bleeding from your cowardly knife look 
do you see this is blood my darling boy's blood one drop of which dead and faded as it is is more precious to me than the whole living pulse of any other man look i come to you to-night christened with his blood and dare you to strike dare you to strike him again through me and mingle my blood with his strike i implore you strike if you have any pity on me for god's sake strike if you are a man look here lay his head on my shoulder here i held him to my breast where never so help me my god another man ah she reeled against the fence and something that had flashed in rance's hand dropped at her feet for another flash and report rolled him over in the dust and across his writhing body two men strode and caught her ere she fell she's only fainted said mr mccluskey jenny dear my girl speak to me what is this on her dress said ridgway kneeling beside her and lifting his set and colourless face at the sound of his voice the colour came faintly back to her cheek she opened her eyes and smiled it's only your blood dear boy she said but look a little deeper and you'll find my own she put up her two yearning hands and drew his face and lips down to her own when ridgeway raised his head again her eyes were closed but her mouth still smiled as with the memory of a kiss they bore her to the house still breathing but unconscious that night the road was filled with clattering horsemen and the summoned skill of the countryside for leagues away gathered at her couch the wound they said was not essentially dangerous but they had grave fears of the shock to a system that already seemed suffering from some strange and unaccountable nervous exhaustion the best medical skill of tuolumne happened to be young and observing and waited patiently an opportunity to account for it he was presently rewarded for toward morning she rallied and looked feebly around then she beckoned her father toward her and whispered where is he they took him away jenny dear in a cart he won't trouble you again he stopped for miss jenny had raised herself on an elbow and was levelling her black brows at him but two kicks from the young surgeon and a significant motion toward the door sent mr mccloskey away muttering how should i know that he meant ridgeway he said apologetically as he went and returned with the young gentleman the surgeon who was still holding her pulse smiled and thought that with a little care and attention the stimulants might be diminished and he might leave the patient for some hours with perfect safety he would give further directions to mr mccloskey downstairs it was with great archness of manner that half an hour later mr mccloskey entered the room with a preparatory cough and it was with some disappointment that he found ridgeway standing quietly by the window and his daughter apparently fallen into a light doze he was still more concerned when after ridgeway had retired noticing a pleasant smile playing about her lips he said softly you was thinking of someone jinny yes father the gray eyes met his solidly of poor john ash her recovery was swift nature that had seemed to stand jealously aloof from her in her mental anguish was kind to the physical hurt of her favorite child the superb physique which had been her charm and her trial now stood her in good stead the healing balsam of the pine the balm of resinous gums and the rare medicaments of sierra altitudes touched her as it might have touched the wounded doe so that in two weeks she was able to walk about and when at the end of the month ridgeway returned from a flying visit to san francisco and jumped from the wing dam coach at four o'clock in the morning the rose of tuolumne with the dewy petals of either cheek fresh as when first unfolded to his kiss confronted him on the road with a common instinct their young feet both climbed the little hill now sacred to their thought when they reached its summit they were both i think a little disappointed there is a fragrance in the unfolding of a passion that escapes the perfect flower jenny thought that night was not as beautiful ridgeway that the long ride had blunted his perceptions but they had the frankness to confess it to each other with the rare delight of such a confession and the comparison of details which they thought each had forgotten and with this and an occasional pitying reference to the blank period when they had not known each other hand in hand they reached the house Mr. McCloskey was awaiting them impatiently upon the veranda. When Miss Jenny had slipped upstairs to replace a collar that stood somewhat suspiciously awry, Mr. McCloskey drew Ridgeway solemnly aside. He held a large theater poster in one hand, and an open newspaper in the other. "'Alice said,' he remarked slowly, with the air of merely renewing a suspended conversation, 
i allus said that riding three horses to onst wasn't exactly in her line it would seem that it ain't from remarks in this year paper it would appear that she tried it on at marysville last week and broke her neck end of the rose of tuolumne by brett hart read by don w jenkins